a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this incredibly cool and fun and amazing episode, Barbara DeLong joins us to talk about her book, Before Roswell, The Secret History of UFOs. Not only that, we, we dive into some old cases, guys. We get on some amazing rabbit holes. She is an absolute delight, and we just have a blast recording this thing. So you are absolutely going to love this conversation. Check all the ways to find her in the show notes. Check all the ways to support us further down there as well. Stick around for after the episode for even more detailed information about some really great things that we're doing in our aligned partnerships as well. But for now, and without any further ado, Barbara DeLong. Barbara DeLong joining us. You are fascinating and incredible. We have been speaking here about your book, Before Roswell, The Secret History of UFOs, as well as your incredible card and your handbook, which we are going to get to your cards uh, here uh, before we're done. My gosh, you're fascinating and interesting and, and a delight <laughs> to talk to. So uh, if you don't mind for my audience not too familiar with you, uh, do you mind just letting us know a little bit more about yourself? Um, sure. I started out life as a uh, school teacher. I taught special education for 25 years. And then I moved into the metaphysical um, full time. And I'm an ordained minister. I, I lecture. I do podcasts. I have a podcast show called um, Nightlight Radio. And I interview authors. I also um, part time am an artist and a poet. and I have found that since I retired, I've never been busier. Uh, so you, you name it. And if it's in the metaphysical field, I probably can talk about it. There aren't many topics that I haven't touched upon in the years that I've done uh, the Nightlight Radio Show. I think there are over a thousand episodes there. And I've interviewed some of the most fascinating people around. I have two master's degrees in education and I call my radio show my PhD program because it's so cool. I, I have an area of interest. I find an author I think is spectacular and well-known. And then I talk him into tutoring me for two hours on the radio. And uh, I have an amazing education because of it. So yes, it's been very exciting. And, uh, you know, I'm, just, I'm still cranking and I'll be 80 next year. So, God, you're crushing it. You're absolutely crushing it. All 79 yeah. year olds out there, just don't worry about it. You should, Barbara's got you covered. Look, this is what you got to look forward to. She's spunky, she's spry, she's crushing. So, with your book, uh, Before Roswell, you and your co author wrote that. So, tell me, tell me about that. How did, how did you meet Ken, first of all? Well, um, <clears throat> it's, it's an interesting story. Mark Eddy introduced us. He was Shout on, out. Yes, he introduced yes. us as well to cut you off, young lady. Mark's will be linked in the show notes. Please continue. Okay. Um, and Ken was on the show and I met him and he went to my website and my website is, you know, uh, you know, Barbara Delong dot com. You know, let's get that out there. Um, it is a, a site that has a tremendous amount of material on it. And it's my umbrella for everything I've been interested in. There's stuff on there. Uh, you know, it really just about everything. And um, prior to Mark Eddy, I was married to Patrick Cook, who was the um, the first person to have a Bible UFO website out there um, when it wasn't when it wasn't famous, and um, he helped to make it famous. And he had a, a phenomenal website that was just spectacular. And when he passed away, I couldn't keep up two websites, and his needed a lot of work on it because he hadn't done anything because the last couple of years he'd had cancer. So 
I checked his website out and everything that was in, he, he's done three books. And most of the stuff on his website were in the three books with the exception of two areas. One was the giant material and the other was the UFO material. And so I moved them over to my website. And immediately, because I had had a UFO experience, I'd seen one, I became an expert in the field because of all of Patrick's research. Ken had been, um, he, Ken works with, with UFO stuff. He's, he's done a number of books on them. And he saw the, the part of my, my website that had to do with UFOs and chronicling, you know, all of them going, you know, I think the last entrance was in 2000, but going back 23,000 years. So it was a phenomenal amount of material. And he contacted me and asked me if he could use the material from the website. And I said, of course, go for it. Get it out there any way we can. And a little while after he contacted me, he called back and he said, do you want to co-write the book? Now, the majority of the book is Patrick's work. We did not put his name on the cover because, let's face it, he's dead. So so it came off my website. So, um, and, and Ken took the material and he divided it into different categories and he wrote a little blurb before each category and he sent me the PDF and, and I added to his blurbs. Uh, he wrote the summary and I wrote the conclusion. And, you know, to say I wrote it is ridiculous. <laughs> you know? It's it's really a, a charming book on the UFO sightings that happened before Roswell. And <clears throat> and to be honest with you, I, I've read the book four or five times and I keep finding things that I find fascinating in it that I didn't know. Um, Ken and I both added a little bit here and there, but for the most part, Patrick wrote the book. And we are finding that it's more a more powerful book than we had actually envisioned or intended. You know, we're delighted it's doing so well. But but it's important for people to understand that there have been UFO sightings. I mean, you, you go back 14,000 years and you find them in, in caves in France. You go back even further. I mean, in the Bible, they're mentioned. Um they're they're all over the place. They they have been with us for as long as we have been here, and they maybe were here before us. So it's hard to it's hard to um, to to write a book about them because there's so much material. But I think it's it was really important that we we stop at Roswell because after Roswell, then then they started to become political. They started to become hidden. They started to, to generate fear in society, which had never been there before. And if you read through the book, you'll see that, you know, some of the farmers that said, yep, I looked in the sky and there was this thing. And then I finished plowing the field and I went and milked the cows. No fear. Um, when, I, when I had a UFO sighting, um, at least with me, there was no fear. You know, it landed on my campus. I saw it take off. I, I could see its VIN number and, you know, then it was gone. But, but you know, I think there's been such fear connected to UFOs that we forget that, that they, they really and truly may have been here before we were. Because the human condition, the human DNA is older than the, the age of the planet, which means humanity came from a different place. So we're not indigenous to Earth. Oh, now we're talking about what we, we talking about here, hybrids or are we talking about maybe like the theory that some we used to be from Mars, like just for an example, and that Adam and Eve are really an escape ship that came here and landed here and then populated the Earth. Or are we talking some, um, I don't know, Anunnaki um, messing with some tampering, as we say? Well, according to my theory, <laughs> which is different from most people's, um, the the whole concept of Adam and Eve, the whole concept of um, a lot of the biblical stuff is what humans have made up to explain something they don't understand. And I don't believe that there was really an Adam and Eve. I do believe that that our DNA 
came from somewhere else, whether it came on a meteor, whether we have been seeded by another culture and another, another leg of humanity from another planet or whatever. Um, I, I think that, that the more I l learn, the more I grow, the more I understand that we all have a piece of, um, of the source of all creation within us. That's our life force. That's our spirit. Um, and that spirit has traveled through time, lifetime to lifetime to lifetime, and probably dimension to dimension to dimension and planet to planet to planet. So um, the whole story of creation here on, on the earth is, in my opinion, a fiction to a great degree that people have made up to explain why we're here and how we're here. But as soon as you you bring religion into it, religion becomes a corporate entity and no longer is a spiritual aspect. So, so you know, I think that we're going through an awakening of the spiritual aspect within us that will allow us to dig through, go, go back to wherever the source material is consciously and and draw that kind of philosophy from it rather than relying upon a church that was created to control people. Preach. Preach, Preach sister. Preach, sister. Yeah, <laughs> we're here with you on this. We're smelling what you're stepping in. Well, and it's a beautiful tie-in to the, the biblical relation to this uh, because your your husband, Patrick, did this. And um, that's a beautiful way to keep him alive, by the way, is to keep talking about him. And I know that that's how we do this. And so uh, high reverence for you, high reverence for that man. So thank you, sir, for your work and your, this is a co-collaboration piece because I'm uh, going through your book here. Fascinating. It even has the great airship flap of 1897, which I just read. Uh, one of the books I've read this year was... Uh, the Secrets of Delshaw by Dennis Crenshaw. Have you ever uh -huh. uh, read that? And it's about uh, Charles A.A. A. Delshaw's work and how they were found in Houston in a in a landfill, like all this crazy cool stuff. So you have these these amazing works in here, and they, like you said, I like again that your your philosophy, y'all's philosophy, to stop at Roswell because the purity the purity of the ones before, you know, because there is it's a there's a before Roswell and an after Roswell. And I like, though, that uh, you focused on all these incredible sightings, because then we look at uh, all the paintings, you know, these ancient old uh, Renaissance paintings of the yeah. UFOs in the sky. And it's like people have been seeing this stuff for a long time. But again, the biblical tie in, because then you uh, look at things like um, the Ark. A lot of folks have talked about that uh, Jonah and the whale and the Ark and things like this are stories of technology, not necessarily maybe divine intervention, but perhaps one could say one in the same, but it's an interesting thing. So now are we talking about perhaps that hominids here were modified, or do you think that this was just a blank planet that perhaps was even terraformed for the species that was to be introduced to it? What do you think? I mean, and just. Well, if you go that way, um, you know, how do you explain the RH factor? How do you, you know, that, that has no explanation. They haven't figured that out yet. Um, I, I don't know. I suffer from incredible um, allergies. So, you know, I'm thinking maybe I, I'm not indigenous to this planet. <laughs> well, Dr. Michael P. Masters has talked about this with his uh, book, Identified Flying Objects. And his whole thing is bipedalism, that there's a lot of um, perils in being bipedal, that our bones and joints and our uh, hearts and circulatory system. And like you said, allergies, there's all sorts of other reasons, which he found interesting uh, in that a lot of the contact cases reported were of bipedal entities. He's like, what's that all about? You know, it's not even the best design in the universe. Why are even mantis beings and reptilians and grays? And what's the deal with this shape, you know? But like you said, maybe it's an implant. Maybe it's the design. And we were just sort of brought here. But we do seem to have a lot of challenges. And being bipedal well, seems to be one of them. Well, yeah. And, but according to my theory, and, and, and it's my new theory I've been playing with for the last five years or so, <clears throat> Our spirits, um, as a spirit, we're, we're etheric. We're, we're, there's no form, there's no shape. It's a consciousness, it's an energy. And when we find a planet that we would, not, a, not so much a planet, but th there is a point in time where, where in the spirit needs to experience physicality. And in order to, to experience physicality, it creates an avatar. And the avatar is the human body that we're in now. And the, the, as when the human, of course, 
now now humans you know procreate and before the fetus actually has life it is it is a it is a combination of of mother and father's dna but before life well when life happens when the heart starts beating that is when the spirit has entered the avatar and brought with it spiritual dna which has the akashic records which has the map for this lifetime so if you look upon it that way this form seems to be what is most indigenous to this planet for survival um so that so that you know if you if you incarnated as a an animal and i don't think we do um then you'd have you know a very short space of time you wouldn't understand emotions you wouldn't understand a lot of the things that that we have to go through in in making our way through this lifetime which is a celebration of life and and it's not meant to be difficult but it is meant to be challenging because that's how we grow yeah. and you know when you have things happen in your life that feels like the world is coming to an end there should be a celebration because it means that you're making a transformation you're going to another level of consciousness you're getting closer to creation and therefore this is a wonderful thing to you know be challenged like that most people think it's punishment it's not punishment it's, it's you've grown this far graduate get through it stop complaining and get on with life um no i i would not say that to anybody but that's basically what it is so um i forgot what you asked me well um, you got me fired up so i'm gonna pop in here because you got me fired up this is exactly what i'm talking about barbara right there that i've been screaming this from the mountaintops for so long so thank you so much for the confirmation on it i appreciate it. we we share the vision on this exact concept thank you i mean it to me um, and I've been through some real tough stuff. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's, there, there are moments when I feel very, would have felt very sorry for myself. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. If this is a lesson, it means that, you know, I'm hot stuff, you know, that I created a situation where I have to grow beyond it. Yeah. So in a way, it's a compliment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is a great way to put it. I always say these, these times or whatever, you know, those moments, those feelings, uh, and they usually come in times and waves or whatever, but they're indicators of level up. You nailed it with this. Yeah. They're like, hey, heads up, your your world's about to go amazing, but let's just settle here for a second. Well, yeah, but you're not being punished. No. You're being challenged. Yes, to grow. You're being invited to step into the next greatest, grandest version of you. And that's yeah. how it's done. Yeah. Yeah. The doors were uncomfortable, you know? They're like uh, <laughs> full of bristles, like passing through a whale's mouth or something, but you got to squeeze through it. So once you get through, though, it's really nice on the inside. There's flowers and stuff. It's pretty. They yeah. play nice music that we like. <laughs> well, uh, so tell me about your UFO sighting. What did, what did you experience? I do feel that you've been like contacted officially yeeted up into the sky, as the kids say, I believe. <laughs> it was in 66. I was in school uh, in, in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Um, I went to Eastern Michigan University, seven miles away from Michigan, um, Uni University of Michigan. It was that period of time when uh, J. Allen Hynek was saying everything was swamp gas. And uh, we were, the, the, the women's dorms were locked at 11 o'clock, like we couldn't get in trouble before 11. But, you know, <laughs> we, we were locked in at 11 o'clock. And we were listening to the, the news um, because that was a terrible thing to say. It was before we had television in every room, you know. So so uh, we heard uh, on, on the news that the uh, flight to the three airports that were around us had been stopped because a UFO had been spotted in the area. And so, of course, you know, we're, we're looking out the windows and then we, we hear that on the news that, that it appears to be around the campus of um, Eastern Michigan University. And then we heard police cars streaking by us with their windows open and their flashing lights and everything. And we heard on the radio, it's landed on the baseball field. We're gonna turn the stadium lights on uh, to see, to, to get a better look. You know, what better way to see something that you wanna sneak up on than to come with <laughs> sirens and flashing lights. Anyhow, 
the, there was a building between my dorm and the baseball field. And we saw the glow of the lights go on. And then we saw this saucer raise up and it swooped over the dorm. And it, it felt to me like it paused there for a minute. Um, it probably didn't. It just felt like it. But it was so close, it blocked out the sky. And then it went and it was gone. Um, no air displacement, no noise, no sound, no nothing. It became a light in the sky and it went towards a larger light in the sky. And as we watched, you know, later on, um, other lights were, were going to this brighter light. Um, what I found fascinating was that, you know, we were all crowded in the windows and some, some people were screaming, some people were crying, some people were hiding in closets for, for what I don't know, but you know, they were all, they were going nuts. And I was standing there saying, that is so cool. <laughs> and I looked around and there was a girl standing next to me. I said, did you see that? And she said, I didn't see anything. I don't know what you're talking about. Really? So, so my, my theory, and I have nothing to base it on other than my own experience, is that it's a level of consciousness. If you see it and you're not afraid, there's a level of consciousness there that says maybe you're ready for more. Um, I have no memory of being visited, of being um, taken anywhere or had anything done to me. I have no memory of it. It doesn't mean it, it doesn't happen. I When I saw close encounters of a third kind, I remember at the very, very end where they were sh uh, shoving Richard Dreyfus into the saucer and they, and they were saying um, he hasn't had the prep work. He hasn't been trained, yada, yada. And a voice, I don't know who said it, but he said, but he was invited. Yeah. And I felt invited. So it changed my life. It total it totally opened a door that said there's far more here than you than than you know than you you experience and and so for the rest of my life, things were never the same. They were never they didn't feel right sometimes. And and after my you know I, I've had a couple of marriages and and always there was something more that I had to be reaching for. So. Um, was I driven to this point in time? I think so. Gently. Thank you very much. But, but, but driven. And when I, when I painted the, um, the deck of cards that, that became the cosmic deck of initiation, I literally survived on an hour or two, a night's sleep. I would get up, I would teach full time, I would go to little league games, I would go to concerts, I would do whatever I had to do. I would paint for 12 hours a night and then sleep and get up and go back to work the next day. Um, I was driven. I was absolutely driven. When I wrote the handbook this last time, I had, I had days that I didn't sleep, that I would just feel suddenly, I would feel a rush, I would go to the computer and I would write and then I would, you know, take a nap. Um, I had, I mean, it, it was, I mean, thank God I'm retired. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I might have done it otherwise, but it was a, it was a tremendous push, but const but I didn't sit down to write unless I felt that, that push of energy knowing that there was something to say. So it took about three months for the book to get written. And, um, it was it was written the same way the cards were painted exactly in order from from physical to spirit and beyond. And so, you know, the, the UFO really did open my world up. And, and uh, certainly having Patrick as my husband opened doors to all sorts of UFO people that I never would have, you know, they never would have talked to me. Had it not been that I was his wife and that, you know, I had done Secrets of the Stones with him and so to so. So it all worked out. Um, and at the time, you never know what the plan is, but, you know, there is a plan and you carry that map inside of you. And, you know, every now and then you, you kind of want to peek, but I like being surprised. So that's where I am today.
So beautiful. You know, like I'm just sitting here in reverence of you, darling, because the uh, same thing I'm, uh, to this point where I'm just open for the universe to surprise me, myself, my higher self, whatever we want to call it. But yeah, it's in full flow and it's this beautiful dance. Uh, like you said, that you're guided by it, but you're not dictating how it's um, that you're just not dictating every little bit of it being nitpicking controlly, you know, which is a pain in the ass, honestly, stepping to this side of it anyway. It was like, oh, that was an exhausting thing. Why did I feel that that was necessary <laughs> yeah. and just now I don't it's great but like you as well first year and a half of this show I survived on maybe two maybe four hours of sleep a night if I was lucky same thing first year and a half it was grind 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 so I I'm absolutely with you again just in reverence here darling so I do want to point out a couple of your favorite cases from the book before we move on because I absolutely want to talk about your deck as well so just sure. give us some highlights because there are just uh, how many cases first of all are in this thing that you Over know of over 300. I yeah. can't, can't count of them. I didn't. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's amazing. I have read through it probably two or three times since, since he did it. And um, I'm amazed that, I mean, we only took 300. We, Ken only took 300 um, instances off the website. There are far more there. Yeah. It sounds like another books in the works, huh? No, no. <laughs> No, UFOs, this is it. Um, I may do something with the giant material because yeah. there's a lot of that there too. Okay, and, I'm not going to forget to ask you about giants before we go. Okay. Okay, okay. And then we'll definitely have you back on for that one. Um, <laughs> okay, so some cases, Doll, if you don't mind. Just uh, some that just stand out to you. Well, let's see. Um, 19, well, 19, uh, 1917 was um, when Admiral Byrd um, Led. Wait a minute. I had it written down here. Um, he he did. Um, can't remember which page it was. Eleven, I think. Um, I would. I want to get it right because it it was. Now Admiral Berg was the pilot that that the. the uh, what do I say? That the, the, there is the whole flack about how he flew into into center Earth and stuff like that and came yeah. out. And, and went back and reported to the government. And they said, oh, for God's sake, keep your mouth shut or we'll kill you. Well, no. Well, yeah, basically that. Um, but he, after he did that, it was 1946 that he led a flotilla of, get this, a fleet of 13 ships, 33 aircraft, 4,700 men to Antarctica because he, he thought that there was a, a Nazi um, group there under, un, under the ice and stuff like that. Because when he flew into center earth, they had swastikas and they were speaking German. So one would think that there was some German influence there at any rate. And he was going to, um, you know, it, it, it was called Operation High, High Jump. And it was supposedly, um, you know, to, to, take over the South Pole, right? Well, he got his ass kicked. He got down there and these saucers came out of the water and they beat the daylights out of them and they came back real fast. And um, and, and it, was, it was a flotilla that was ready for combat, right? And he came back and, and, and one of the things he, he said, he said to the press, they didn't give any, any report about, you know, what they found or anything like that. But his, he said that we have to be careful about, to be aware that there could be um, technology that we couldn't combat, you know, and, and he was very quiet after that. Yes, he was. <laughs> and and it, 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 it's like, and, and if you read his diary, he, his, it's in print of, of his visits to um, Middle Earth. It, it, it's, it's a bit much, but, you know, you wonder, was he smoking something, but his navigator was with him. So, you know, they, they went along with the story. So I, I don't know, but I do know that, that um, when he took that, they lost a ship or two. They lost, they lost airplanes. They, they definitely were going down there thinking that they were in full control and going to take over this base. And they were, you know, not a chance. They turned tail and ran. So that's one of the times that, you know, U.S. government is not not exactly. Again, it's after it's a, it's before. It's before Roswell. It, 
before Roswell or right at Roswell? I want to say it's it's 46 and Roswell was 47. Yeah. So right before. And it was interesting, too, because right. I've studied the Operation uh, High Jump quite a bit. And it was uh, right after, you know, World War Two. So we we had all these battered soldiers. We lost all these people. And then two years later, you want to drag a flotilla with all of our sons that just came back from war down to go explore Antarctica and, uh, under the auspice of looking for pigeons. And then some of them didn't come home. You're like, what are you talking about? We just got back from World War Two. We just saved all of our boys. We just did this thing. And now you're going to send them out there and do this. Plus the yeah. Cold War, it was on the right at uh, the leading edge of the Cold War. So they're like, what the hell are we doing sending these resources down here? None yeah. of it made sense from any direction other than they were going down there to fight Nazis and get their ass kicked by UFO Nazis. It's great. Well, you, you got also um, the Battle of Los Angeles, which which was 41, I think. 42. 42. OK. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, That's OK. I just went over. I just said something about it the other day. That's the only reason it's right on my mind. Yeah. OK, well, well, anyhow. Um, this, this ship or ships, um, m- slowly moved up the coast. And when they thought that the Japanese were invading, and so they had in, in Los Angeles, they had spotlights set up, they had military there, there were, there, there were, they were ready to, you know, shoot stuff out of the sky. And, um, this, this, uh, we had on Patrick's show, which was, um, Matrix Radio, we had a man on who was at the Battle of Los Angeles. He was a young a young kid. He watched it out of his window and he watched the, the uh, artillery shooting at this ship. It was huge and everything exploded before it got to the ship so that there was some sort of field around it that was protecting. Now, there were deaths there there were they called them um um oh great they they there there were collateral damage there were deaths because of the fact that our 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 missiles or our bombs hit this field and then fell to the beach and stuff and and people were killed because they were hit by the um the fragments that of the of the shells that we were sending against this particular um, craft. And the next day, um, he and all of his friends went to the beach and they, the army paid them for each, all the fragments that they picked up on the beach. So, um, it, it was amazing to talk to a man that had seen this, lived through it and still couldn't explain it. But, you know, it, it is a little reminiscent of, of Phoenix Lights. But, you know, in, in the case of Phoenix Lights, there, there were no bombs or anything. So, but, um, you know, it, those are such, you know, an, again, though, another example of there was no aggression on the, on the, uh, on, on the saucer. The saucer wasn't fighting back. It wasn't defending itself. It, it was just, I guess, sightseeing. I don't know what else you call it. Yeah, sightseeing um, the mortar shells. Um, yeah. Well, bad call on their part. You know, I mean. Yeah. It, it's a fascinating case. And it is one of those where exactly like you said, I like that you referred it to the Phoenix Lights because uh, I didn't put it in the same category before, but now I absolutely do just due to their non-hostility. And, and again, uh, our reactions were different. Uh, the government at least didn't lie about it then. They just shot at it. Uh, now they just lie to you and tell you it's flares or something like that. So, Well, yeah. And, and the reality here is after Roswell um, and, and, and these, you know, they, they started to put out material that, that put fear into the hearts of the, of, of the people, which is ridiculous because um, I, I know that there are people out there that say they have been abducted. And I know that they truly believe that they were abducted. I would not call them liars. I would say that they are, they are saying exactly what they believe happened. I, I don't get that feeling. I, I know that they say that Eisenhower um, made a contract with UFOs, with the, with the aliens. Now, stop and think a second. How stupid is it to sign a contract? It's someone from another planet who has come to this planet. I mean, what makes you think that they're going to honor it? What makes you think they live by the same code? How are you even going to enforce it? It's silly. It's an IOU for some nonsense is what it is. Let me back you up. 
live by the same code. What do we do with the Native Americans when we took their land over? Oh, yeah. What makes them think they could trust us? Absolutely. That, that absolutely goes without saying. Yeah. I mean, we, we do not have a history of, of abiding by contracts. <laughs> Honoring our word. Yeah. No, not at all. And a piece of paper with an alien race. Are you nuts? That just I, they think we believe this. Well, that's the thing, right? Uh, there was an agreement, guys. No, it's okay. They're going to give us technology. It's fine. The military is going to use it. Y'all aren't. Uh, you'll get it in your TV or something, maybe eventually, uh, 50 years from now. But they're just going to take a handful of folks. Don't worry about it. They were like people you didn't care for anyway. And then mostly out of like uh, national forests and stuff like that. So don't worry about it, you know. But we get fiber optics. You don't have to walk up to the TV and turn it on anymore. And Velcro. Yeah, and Velcro. That's right. No, I mean, I, I've i talked to... Um, Eisenhower's daughter. I've had her on the show. Yeah, Laura. Yeah. Um, I don't buy it. I don't buy it at all. Um, we, you know, and, and the different alien races, you know, I, I know that uh, Werner von Braun said that they had, they had help with their missiles and things like that from beyond. I don't know. I don't yeah, think so. On Werner von Braun's uh, tombstone. Have you seen the uh, the Bible inscription on his tombstone? No. Uh, it is a Bible verse that says something about that the handiwork of God is revealed in the firmament above. So a lot of flat earth people are sitting here saying, well, the space guy said flat earth is a thing. So it's on his tombstone. Like, why would he put it there? You know what I mean? So that's an interesting one. I, I want to say it's uh, Ephesians 19 to something like this. Anyway, it's an easily Googleable thing. But yeah, it's pretty interesting that he had that on there. Well, it was interesting when um, Hitler had that group of psychics that was advising him with um, Maria Auschwitz, Aush uh, Maria Abramovich. something. Abr no, Abramovich? It no, it began with an O, I think. Orsic. Uh, Orsic, yes, yes, something like that. Yes. And they showed her picture to Billy Meyer. And Billy Meyer said, that's Samyasi. Yeah, the Pleiadians that were hanging out with him in, Swe in Switzerland, right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I shake my head at that. I can't explain it. Because then but, what's the deal? Are they helping both sides? Are they helping anything? Are they, you know, what's going on with that? Are they playing both sides? Like, Well, as far as I, I can figure, they should have a non-intervention because Star Trek did. Well, but Star Trek may be one of those psychological operations. I've thought about this, that maybe, yes, we're under the impression that um, sort of like the uh, Asimov's codes, right, uh, for the... AI. Oh, they're, no, no, no. They're not going to hurt you because it's built into the code. Oh, yeah, yeah. We saw it on Star Trek. It's built into the intergalactic code that we made up from our human perspective that they can't do anything, that there's a non-intervention. But it seems like <laughs> that they intervene all the damn time in things they want to. But then things like, let's say, I don't know, the Holocaust, they seem to just kind of take a back seat or be too busy for. It's it's really interesting. We I think per, anthropomorphize a lot of a lot of hope onto these things, a lot of like, hey, they're going to come save us. Hey, it's all working out. Hey, it's going to do anything. And then it kind of pass. It adds pacificity into the society, which they could have handled things themselves. If this makes sense, sort of like the Bolshevik revolution or like mm -hmm. Q. Some people say that these things are infiltrated to say like, hey, don't worry about it. We've got it covered for you from a higher perspective. And you just have to have faith. Uh, religions talk about this same thing. So it's interesting um, whenever we talk about this non-intervention thing, and I'm seeing it all over the damn place, allegedly. And it's like, well, when's the our intervention going to happen, right? <laughs> well, if you look at, um, are you familiar with the Rendlesham? You must be Rendlesham Forest. I had Jim Penniston on. He's great. Yeah. Yeah. His when he when he touched the the uh, drone, he got the binary code, and the binary code, uh, among other things, said that something about the human condition was worth continuing um watching so to speak and from 8100 now at first i thought isn't that cool we're still here um in 8100 and then i thought wait a minute the human condition it didn't say we're still here it said the human condition is still there um and and you know someone from 8100 was looking back and saying we're going to keep watching them i mean if you stop and think you know nazca is not is not uh spiritual graffiti um you know i mean there, there are things going on here but i you know i i have trouble 
with with you know signing contracts and i have trouble with a lot of the other things they say are going on because the source of all creation cre is exactly that the source of all creation so whatever is out there is also a brother to a certain degree of us we have a sin as there's a connection and I am more inclined to think that we're in quarantine until our consciousness rises to the place where where our main theory isn't, you know, can we make a weapon of it? How can we kill other people? You know, I mean, you know, we're, we're awfully barbaric down what? here. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I, I do not disagree with you on any point of this, actually. And this is where you get like the prison planet idea, which is sort of a terrifying one to me, but that's okay. We could live with it. Now, this uh, is Jim Pennison's message. I wanted to pull this up because I didn't oh, have good. it from memory here. But uh, here's our show when you Google Jim Pennison's binary code message, our show comes up hollow. So this was it right here. This So he wrote down this series of ones and zeros. And actually, it's uh, the, here's an image of his actual notebook right here. This is the stuff that he said on the show, guys, if you remember. And in fact, I'll just link the episode back uh, down there for everybody to check out and freshen up on. But if you remember the episode, he stuck this in a box and just wrote these numbers down, ones and zeros, uh, just so he could get some sleep. And yeah. he wrote them all down, threw them in a box. And 30 years later, somebody on Project Camelot, when he was shooting, he had his journal with him. And the guy was like, that looks like binary code. He was like, what is binary code? So he ran it through the machine. And this is what the, the code that came out. Binary code transmitted by UF, uh, landed UFO uh, at REF Woodbridge Bentwaters. And this was by Jim Penniston. He touched the thing. And here you go. Exploration of humanity, 8100. Yep. So uh, continuous for planetary advance fourth coordinate and so there's a bunch of coordinates on here now all of these have been looked up and i wanted to say they were like the pyramids of giza teotihuacan yeah. um bermuda triangle like some interesting locations physically on the earth and then it reads eyes of your eyes origin and then another 8100 uh, yep and then origin year 8100 mm -hmm. hmm. who's origin year yeah that's that's that uh, you know kind of i, I is think this it, us from the future do you think it's something like that I think it's from the future. I don't know if it's us. Okay, that's fair. What are your thoughts on like that Earth just sort of goes through these experiment phases? Like you said, we're not from here. And there seems to be a lot of structures here that have been that outdate really what man they say is was capable of at the time or, you know, however you want to put that. Do you think well, that perhaps that there's some sort of like planetary takeover if you want or experiment to where it's all reptilians? And then it's just them for a while. And then maybe a cycle goes through like a Kali Yuga or procession of the equinoxes. And you basically get a speed dating with Gaia sort of a thing. Like the reptilians get their time here and then they get to figure it out. Maybe blast off and then humans get their turn. What are your thoughts on something like that? Well, if you look at Philip Lindsay's cycles of eight cycles of humanity, um, he says that we go through these cycles over and over and over again. And it's a spiral. And it's at different levels. And at the end of each each level, there is a mass destruction type of, of experience in which some people survive. And then at that point, um, wisdom teachers from another dimension probably come into the into the into the dimension and, and give us tools in order to evolve society yet again. If you look at um no, I can't remember who it is now. Carve Mark Carvello, he he has a great deal of stuff going with the shifting of the poles and how the shifting of the poles puts these sites that are, especially in South America, as older than Giza because they're all oriented um, to to north to north south, and the ones in South America are off, and they're off because the, there was a pole shift, and the pole shifts sometimes shift as much as 2000 miles overnight. So you can imagine the kind of destruction that the world goes through at that time. And then every now and then the, the poles actually shift so that the South Pole becomes the North Pole and the North Pole becomes the South Pole. And so, you know, I, I really, I'm kind of inclined to go, you know, with them. I think my problem with yugas is that we always go back to square one and we never get beyond their last level. So I'm not sure I buy the yuga stuff as much as Philip Lindsay, who's spiraling constantly 
upward so that our level of consciousness is evolving, hopefully. Honestly, I mean, cognitively, that makes more sense to me. And that resonates with me more. I know if you want to if you want to use that woo woo term, it absolutely resonates with me more. It feels more like a progression because why would you just kick all the blocks over and start over? You know, you would still after having the knowledge of building the castle with the blocks, you would still know how to build blocks. So you yourself wouldn't erase your memory completely like this has to be an evolutionary process because there are too many things, like you said, with the Akashic, with the information that folks just have innately seems to be some sort of higher you've lived a few lifetimes you've gotten some stackable you know data on top of this you know of some measurable results and that's that would seem to be again then the point of all of these lives right what's the point living all these damn lives uh, maybe it's just a quarter you put in a machine on the other side you live the life and then it's over and then you're just done with it oh i'm gonna go play the barbara DeLong game now and mm -hmm. then you put a quarter in the barbara DeLong game and you're running you're running around as you the whole time I'm more with you. I I feel that there's something way bigger happening. And I feel that with conversations like this and all the stuff that we do here, it feels that this is, this is what's getting us closer is by asking these questions and expanding consciousness in this way. So I'm grateful for your participation in this activity. Uh, I did want to ask you about some of the UFOs that you think are man-made. Do you think that this is uh, strictly an extraterrestrial or divine thing? Or do you think that man <laughs> has been able to whittle a few in his backyard there well i think prior to 47 um i think they were they were they were other people other other cultures other races or whatever since then uh, you look up in the night sky and you just don't know if it's ours, if it's China's, if it's the Philippines, if it's the Japanese, if it's the Russians, if the, if it's, you know, whoever. You, you just, you can't tell anymore. Everybody has drones of some sort up there. And I think, too, um, in, in, in my opinion, um, anything that we see are just drones. They aren't spaceships. Now, now I will say that there are um, NASA photographs of, of disks and stuff like that in the sun's corona. I think they're not taking sun baths, they're, they're refueling. Um, I think that there are definitely out there motherships of some sort. No question. But what we see in our night sky are drones mm. that, that come from maybe maybe the dark side of the moon, where, wherever. But we're not seeing we're not seeing real spaceships at all. I, I think probably what even landed on my campus was a drone of some sort. Um, I don't think they manned them. I mean, and and if you go to the book, I mean, my goodness, they're, they're the one with Aurora, Texas, the 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 uh, the ship hit a windmill and and crashed, and you know they 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 fixed it a little bit and it took off again, and then it crashed and burned and. Uh, they thought it originally there were six you know, people in it, but they only found one body and it was a very small man. And the, the citizens of Aurora um, had a funeral for him. And, you know, I think and, and we got the we got the report of the event from a woman whose mother would not let her go to the crash site, but let her go to the funeral so that, you know, you got to think it's real. And <laughs> and and then. After years and years, some agency wanted to exhume the body and the people in Aurora, Texas would not tell them where it was. They wanted him to rest in peace. So um, that's my that's one of my favorite. No, no, actually, my favorite piece of trivia from the book, which which I'm going to talk about it so much, it will no longer be trivia, but it was trivia when I saw it. The first human being to shoot down a UFO. Go on. <laughs> the Red Baron from Germany. Really? Yes. The the fighting ace, the pilot? Yes. The one the pizzas are named after? A and Snoopy's companion, That's yes. Right. That's right. The real Red Baron. He was the first person to shoot down a UFO. How did they validate that kill or that? I think, you know, it was reported when he came back and and um, the pilot was not killed. He he escaped and he ran into the woods. They never found the pilot. But it was just it was it, it, it again. It was so long ago that there was no fear to it. 
and he shot it down and it crashed. You know, I think of this time like this uh, steampunk era where they were moving and there was sort of um, a little bit of what they would call technology and it was just rough and clunky, but that there were weird things all around before they drove them all to extinction. Like many people, like pygmies and things like this in the jungles, you hear of many people, uh, species, think of the countless like megafauna that were here probably right about the same time because there's even images and paintings i mean take this for what you will pottery that had human beings hanging out with dinosaurs like had leashes on them and riding them around and stuff like that so then you wonder it was just sort of this time i think where there were still pterodactyls flying around in the sky and people with muskets you know shooting these things it i picture it as just an interesting time here's one that wasn't in the book that should have been um but well, no, it, it 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 wasn't in the book. 1938, a Chinese archaeologist was um, looking in in caves and stuff like that, um, and it, on the on the border between China and Tibet, he he stumbled into this cave that had these circular discs. There were 716 of them. They looked like records. It was almost stone-like, but they looked like records, and they had grooves in them, and they were they they were called dropa stones, and they were in a in a museum um, in China, I guess, and they finally were able to examine them more closely, and they found that the in the grooves were um, glyphs of some sort. And when the glyphs and, and it's like a record groove, you know, it's that small. So you had to really be microscopic to get into the grooves. And the story was that they were um, in a spaceship that crashed on Earth. Their ship was absolutely destroyed. They had to mingle in with the people here and, and live out their lives. Now, that sounds pretty far fetched, right? Not for this it, show. Well, Okay, so so today there is a tribe called the Dropa, yeah. who are small sized individuals. The tallest one is three to three between three and four feet that are still living in that area. Do you think they could be descendants of that that crashed race of people? You think? <laughs> Damn. See, it's and, stuff like that, right? That wouldn't make the, you know, Adam and Eve scenario that far-fetched. Maybe it was just something to where a UFO crashed here and there was nothing here. Or maybe there were a few things here, but we, you know, we could breathe the air and all that kind of stuff. And it just worked out. Well, I, I you know, 10, 15 years ago, my theory on Atlantis, uh, which today does not seem so far-fetched, um, my theory was a mothership had a flat tire landed in the ocean and terraformed itself to disguise itself. And as they terraformed, you know, they, it became what was known as Atlantis, that they needed to have certain materials in order to heal their ship so that they could take off and fly home. And for hundreds of years, they were searching and they would send emissaries out to developing cultures. And, and, they finally did find what they needed. They repaired the ship and they took off. And overnight, Atlantis was gone. However, the people that they had left here, because they left all their emissaries here, because they were get out of town quick, um, had technology that were able to move stones, were able to do, and those were the builders of the of Stonehenge, of the pyramids, of the of the um, stuff in, in South America. And after they died out. Of course, their technology went with them and their ability to move stones with thought or music or sound or whatever. So that the the actual builders of all these edifices were only a one generation. And they basic and yet the people may may have been longer lived than we are, so that they may have held on longer. Wow. I like that Atlantis theory. I, I really do. I've heard something similar with uh something having to do with the uh a couple of different cultures here, like specific races of people coming here and then their ship being specifically either marooned or uh, invading or something like that. But it's an interesting theory. It's a fascinating, 
because we can't rule any of it out. And this is what makes this conversation so much more fun, I think, is that that kind of history is so much cooler than any boring like little, I don't know, even with dinosaurs running around a comet hitting, that's fine. But this is so much more interesting and it just sort of gives us something more to look forward to, I feel. You know what I mean? It's it's cooler, right? Well, you, you have the guy that did the um, the coral uh, the coral castle in, in um, Florida. He was using sound yeah. to move all of those those stones. And, you know, of course, he did say he had figured out how they did it in Egypt. And uh, he probably had. And I think it's very sad that he never shared it with anybody because it was, I mean, he was moving um, incredible, you know, huge stones overnight with no machinery, no nothing, no help. And, and you know, unfortunately, he was so much of a, I, I guess, an introverted person that, that he didn't share with anybody. And he just quietly took his secret with him to the grave. Yeah, I wonder, because uh, Ed Lee Scallion, he was this, you know, five foot nothing Latvian guy that moved over here, right? And that was his whole thing is he was here to create his castle for his love, his sweet 16 that was supposed to move over here. And then he got over here, he started working on everything, and then she broke his heart and left him. She said, no, I found another dude. And so now he's here. And so I wonder, I mean, this is just one of my things, I don't know, in the phenomena we do this, I guess. I wonder what it would have been like, you know, the alternate universe where she did come over here and maybe Ed Lee Scallion was able to share that work with everyone and maybe create an incredible technology out of there and be motivated by love, you know, be inspired rather than heartbroken. I think that that's honestly just what happened. He got heartbroken. Oh, yeah. No, I totally agree. Mm. And, and take uh, care of your men out there, ladies. <laughs> we're we're more uh, uh, frail than you think. Well, it, it's it's it, it, it's a thought, but, you know, I have. I believe that that our our spirits and, and and there's a big difference between our brain, which is I, I consider the brain, the soul, and the spirit, that piece of the infinite that is within us. So that it's it's body, soul, spirit. Instead of body, mind, mind and soul to me are interchangeable. Okay. And it's, like it. it's it's the spirit that is that you know travels through time and and stuff, so so that I believe the spirit that is in our body that is riding in this avatar has has such power that you know we haven't been able to tap into it, and I think rightly so, because if I swear to you, if if suddenly, you know, I I had the capability of being able to set fire at, at will or whatever. The government would be at me and probably want to dissect me to figure out how I did it. Um, I, I had a boyfriend once that said, "You better be careful about what you do because there's a white table waiting for you someplace." You know, for <laughs> when you die. But but um, but I do believe that that the spirit within us has the. I mean, come on, it's traveled through time. It's it's. It's immortal. It can do almost anything. And when it's in spirit form, its capabilities are phenomenal. But in physical, it has to work with what we've got here. And I think one of the coolest things is that, that our avatars, our, our bodies, um, are like a car. And, and, you know, we designed our car and, and it, has, it has the options that are all there, but we don't have the handbook that goes with the car. So we can turn the headlights on and maybe the windshield wipers, but that's it. <laughs> and, and the spirit within sometimes has to get frustrated that it's not able to make its way into the consciousness to be able to facilitate the use of the power that's there. I, I, think, I think we have been so, this sounds terrible, but corrupted by religion and limited by religion because our power is our power and to think that we have to be controlled by a, a church or a belief system um limits our, our capabilities and i'm not saying there's not a source of all creation um a divine source that is pure love i mean absolutely i know that's there i i, I believe that with all my heart but i don't believe that that the element of worshiping is part of this deal you know be, becoming an emissary an emissary of it of sharing it of sharing the knowledge and wisdom that's there absolutely a hundred percent but 
creating a religion. No, we are our own temple. We are our own religion unto ourselves. And, you know, I, I... Well, religions are at the point we are with this, probably with the unity consciousness perspective, they're a little uh, narcissistic, aren't they? Because you sit there and just sing songs to yourself all day and praise yourself all day and then bow down to yourself. But then you, your physical self can't be as good as yourself. You know what I mean? It's <clears throat> it's just an interesting process that these um, folks engage in. Now, I do see the value in the ego structures like that. I don't see them important for folks like you and I anymore. But I do uh, find I found it valuable going through that to know that it wasn't for me because I was raised in Southern oh, yeah. Baptist, the Baptist church out there. Oh, and okay. I just realized, well, you know what? Pass. Not for me. But I appreciate I, the education. I, right. Yeah. I, I've, I've been a little bit of everything all, all over the place. And I find and every major religion is founded on the golden rule. Do so, that, yeah. I mean, if you hold to that, you, you can't go wrong. They don't preach that. But they t- they talk about it in the finer notes, you know. It's like assumed, and then they're like, "And eh, now let's say y'all about the, all the places you're going to go because you're doing it wrong," you know. And so, like, okay, uh, it's just an interesting. I mean, it's a psychology in itself, and I agree with you that it it facilitates a reading level. But for us, we don't need that uh, anymore at our reading level, right? No. Now, let me, I I wanted to ask you about this case because I'm I've got your book pulled up here, 1676, England, Edmund Haley. Anybody out there, uh, Edmund Haley? Oh, Haley's Comet. Yeah, Haley's Comet. But he saw something before that. So in March of 1676, when he saw a vast body, apparently bigger than the moon, he estimated it at 40 miles above him. He also Mm -hmm. stated that it made a noise, I love this, like the rattling of a great cart over stones. (laughs) What a description. And then after estimating the distance it traveled in a matter of minutes, he came to the conclusion that it moved at a speed greater than 9,600 miles per hour. Now, uh, I don't know what Edmund Haley's perspective of speed was back in 1676. I think that they thought going faster than 30 miles an hour would kill you and that the human body (laughs) couldn't do that. Um, But 9,600 miles an hour, I like that because he was 95. No, no, no. It had to be 96. This is fascinating. I mean, it's an interesting thing. And again, the, the rattling like a like a cart over great stones. I mean, it's it's one of those interesting stories. What what are your thoughts on sort of a breakaway civilization that maybe there's a part of humanity early on, maybe before Haley's time here, uh, that figured some really interesting things out here, or maybe uh, took the heedance of the Atlantean teachings and just sort of did their own thing and let humanity go the way that it did, which is mostly what you and I participate in, probably but then also decided to maybe shag ass and see what they could do with some really cool technology. Again, I'm sort of reminded by the 18, uh, the mid 1800s uh, airship sightings within that book. Uh, he talked about this NB gas that they used in these airships and that it was very secretive and that it, nobody could know the secret formula. And so I'm thinking that perhaps even then within those ranks of the secret organization, even one person controlled the NB gas that powered all of these things. And when he died, this Pete uh, Navarro guy, when he died, um, Peter Mingus, rather, all of it uh, went with him. So the air club ended allegedly. So again, this idea of breakaway civilizations and stuff like that. What do you think? Well, I think there's a possibility. I do believe that that um, in the Arctic, um, there still is some sort of uh, group of people underground there that, that are hiding out. And, and I would hide out from what's going on in the world today, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that that over the generations that that they you know when the war ended um they were kind of marooned there and that that i think they probably are still there uh i i would i i I find it very difficult to understand why there are places in the arctic where there are no fly zones why Not even polar bears are there, and, for heaven's sake. And commercial flights don't go over. I mean, there it's it's very, very, very interesting. You can't go there. Even the people who are like, oh, you can go to Antarctica. You can go to a three-mile peninsula any that's heavily guarded all the way around it. You can't go anywhere further than that. So it's it, like you, there's a consideration to these things, but I'm with you. I, there's some massive mystery going on here. Uh, it's it's huge and it's amazing. And I think you and I just keep finding more things like what the official story here is as yeah. just non-pacifying and at least something that we can look at to say, well, that's not what's going on. So we can start and, with that. You know, I, I, you know, I, it's, it's today every now and then when I hear something, it's like, oh, you got to be kidding. How about <laughs> how about these stupid balloons that 
um, that that helped us so greatly on the sale of this book because they they the book came out exactly at the same time these balloons went across the country. Perfect. And, you know, the one balloon, you know, after it had gathered all its information and relayed it back to its source, we shot down. Good for us. <laughs> um, they should have shot it down over the Azores. You know, I don't know. Yeah, don't get me started. But but the other balloons, the octagon shaped one. What about that? Yeah. That was metal. That wasn't a balloon. And the other one, there was another one, too. Um they they give no indication of, of what that is or where they were. You know, it's right back to Roswell. It's like it was a weather balloon. No, it wasn't. Yes, it was. And, and people will forget. Not today. Not anymore. You know, you, you don't tell me that the, the one balloon was I mean, it, it was it had it had the capability of sending and receiving directions. It, it was steered. It wasn't floating on any airwaves. It was going over military bases. And, you know, holy crap. I mean, how stupid do they think we are? Very Incredibly. stupid. Incredibly. Very hey, stupid. I, I have a theory on this. I think that they're making it that dumb on purpose. What do you think? So that people will absolutely look at it and figure it out. I think that there's honestly like a big play going on here to where it's a big... Um, like you playing you in a game of how you doing kind of a thing. And that really sort of the powers that be that have control over this information are leaking it in a way. Like you said earlier, if you could just start setting fire with shit, it'd freak you. Not only would there be p people knocking on your door, but think about it, darling. It would freak you out. You would be like, what the hell is going on here? It would be a shock. And so I feel that a lot of these things are being revealed as they can be, but also they're being, there's a dumbness in society that keeps getting propped up in people's inability to see these things. And then there's these leaks that are coming out that are so obvious. They're obviously fakes or dumb or something. I feel that there's a meeting in the middle that's occurring is what I feel. And I think that you and I are just sort of out here going, well, okay. <laughs> we I, can see I mean, it, but... you know, it, it's, they tell you something and they expect you to swallow it whole, whole, whole cloth. I mean, it, it's stupid. I think they do that. They're hoping that you won't, though. They're they're giving you something so dumb that you stand up and you say, hang on, this is stupid. We're demanding sovereignty here. We're actually demanding this because we all need to do that. And it's up to us to do that. No one can do it for us. No one's going to come save us. I'm ready for the non-intervention policy to be over, but it doesn't. I'm not going to hold my breath waiting for, you know, Zeta Reticulin to come over here and tell me it's going to work out. So I, I feel it's an opportunity for us to kind of uh, in in so many words, get our shit together. And um, that's what these things sort of do. They invite us in to greater conversations. And then when the government obviously has nothing uh, sa satiating to say about it, then it's our opportunity to say, well, then we need something different going on here. And again, I, th I think it's part of a huge, huge thing. And these are just small little droplets of well, consciousness. When you look at what science fiction has done, it has totally made aliens, you know, into monsters. Yeah. And and when you look at what what humanity has done with with wise people that have come preaching peace and love, you know, we kill them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we used you know, to. I don't think we're doing that much anymore. I think I it led us to the point to where we got to this critical mass. I really feel it. And I know you feel this is different than phenomena too, even just on the UFO conversation. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would have been burned at the stake long ago if, if you know, I, I probably was at one point burned. At the I stake. was going to say, you and I have probably been stoned, <laughs> burned, all that. You and I have been witches tied up right next to each other going, well, maybe in another life. I don't know. We'll come back in 2023 or something. And do yeah. A radio show. I, I just, you know, it, it to me, it's, it's, it feels like they're trying to make us afraid of something we shouldn't be afraid of. Agreed. This is why they always have military people on talking about it, not Barbara DeLong. Why aren't you on Fox News talking about this from your perspective, having been an experiencer and a contact to yourself? Like, what's going on with that? Oh, okay. it's no. phrased in the military. To, oh, I yeah. think that's on purpose. Yeah. Well, and look at I think the one the one thing that really makes me slightly crazy is, um, you know, you know, there are times that, that many of the cultures have been saved by the ant people, right? And everybody thinks that these are these are people that are that, that look like ants. And that's just stupid. They live underground. underground. Yeah. Therefore, they're ant people. I mean, you know, this the sky people live in the sky. I mean, it doesn't mean that the 
they, they flap wings like birds. It means that they're in ships or whatever. I mean, they are they are taking things that are happening and they are making them frightening for people. And I don't understand that. I think um, it's on that's on purpose. Absolutely. I mean, you look at at the places that have been dug during Kuyu for for one, you know, who is you know thirteen levels down. It's it's carved out for humanoids. It's not carved out for ant-like people. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, please. I mean, it, it just, I I don't know. You know, sand people live in the desert and, you know, the whole thing. So, so anyhow, that's, that's, um, that's my thought on the whole thing. I think that, that over time in, in, in history, these, these vehicles, whatever, look at, look at in the Bible, you know, the wheels within the wheels. I mean, Everything has been always everything has always been described within the frame of reference of the culture that was experiencing it. So so if something happens today, we will only describe it to our own frame of reference. And you have to think that the cultures or whatever that are visiting us or or, or are already here are so far ahead of us that we have no way of I I mean, I do believe that there is a, an etheric culture that lives possibly in the same dimension we do, but the frequency is so different that, that you know, we don't even, you know, rub elbows anywhere. Yeah, that there, it could be there right are, here. Yeah. And probably sitting in, and, you know, we could easily be there their Friday night comedy hour as, you know, let's see what the humans are up to now. You know? <laughs> let's tune into this crazy business. It's great. Yeah. It's always entertaining. It's, it's an interesting place and uh, folks like you make it even more fun. So thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, I'm going to, we're going to wrap it here, but I'm, I'm going to have you come back for giants in a quick turnaround. So I've got it noted here. We're going to get you back on to talk some giants with us very soon. Cause I'm a giant sure. fan of that concept. Barbara DeLong, thank you so much. All the ways, of course, to find you located down in the show. Did you have an open invite to come back anytime, darling? This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Just want to take a moment here and thank that delightfully wonderful woman, Barbara DeLong, for coming by and just being herself and absolutely wonderful and amazing. Her book, Before Roswell, The Secret History of UFOs, will be linked below as well as how to reach out to her as well as how to reach out to Mark Eddy to thank him for that connection. Also down in that show description area down there, we have our aligned partnerships. We love this and we're so proud to present these folks to you. So we have Food Forest Abundance. Guys, get your freedom from fear on. Also Opus, the organization for paranormal understanding as well as support. Also the Manifestor's Guide. Level up like crazy with that, guys. Expanding reality, all caps, no spaces at checkout. Super great deal. Also, uh, Coherent Spaces, get a wish unit of your own. Dr. Doug Maskey is hand-making these damn things, and he sends it out with love, and I'm grateful for mine. And it goes out on all the episodes. So get your own down there, Coherent Spaces. Check it out. As well as uh, Christian Yordanoff has offered you all the access for his Detop workshop at 30% off. There's a link down there for it. Amazing work that that dude's doing. We love Christian. As well as, guys, the Luminous Education Revolution. Dr. Edith Mbutu Chan is doing some remarkable work with this project. It's building communities that are outside of the normal education system. We are not uh, subscribing anymore to the idea that uh, this should be a nation of workers, not thinkers. And this idea has really taken off. So check the show description down there, guys, for the link for the Luminous Education Revolution. Also just want to mention here as well, the Conscious Awakening Network is outstanding and we're having such a blast doing these things over here. Pat Mahan just joined us for the last one. These are every Friday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Central Time. So just do the math accordingly. Come hang out with this. It's completely free. It's completely live and it's a lot of fun. So... With all that being said, guys, thank y'all so much for being here, for being a part of all of this, for enjoying all of this messaging, for being on board with our mission. A lot of wonderful things are happening with the publishing house. Reach out if you'd like to be of service in any way. If you like, dude, I'm just tired of sitting on the sidelines. I got to get involved. We have so many amazing projects and incredible people to connect you with. Reach out if you feel called when hearing this. I also just want to take a moment here and thank you all for everything that you are doing for the collective and for yourselves and for your families and what you're doing to level up here. 
And so I bid you farewell at the end of this episode by just encouraging everyone to just continue moving about this incredibly beautiful place. Grab a piece of litter off the ground if you're so compelled. Be nice to everybody that you come across. You know, pick up a, like I said, a piece of litter, but also maybe the tab, you know, next to you at a restaurant. If you see a family sitting there, maybe you just want to pick up their meal. Maybe you want to pick up the grocery bill or somebody's coffee, something like that. It's um, it's a it's a small thing, or it can be that just has massive ripples out, just such bigger than the currency used to exchange it. And I know that y'all feel me when I say that. Beyond all that as well, guys, get out of the left-hand lane because that's a huge pain in the ass if you've got somebody behind you wanting to pass, just scoot on over. As well, of course, and beyond anything else, go out into this beautifully magical realm, whatever the hell this thing is, y'all, and y'all just be good to one another. Thank you so much for watching, listening, engaging, and just being the coolest, coolest deliberate creators out there. We'll see you next time.